So good day, friends. This is Dr. Bob Hamilton, and you have tuned in today to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. So before we begin, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning into this podcast. It means so much to me. The reality is that every week on Tuesday, we release a show, and they're great shows. I have to say, I have uh, been able to find an amazing group of people to uh, share with you. And it's been, uh, let me tell you, it's been a, a point of growth in my own life to actually have these conversations. And, uh, and today, by the way, is, is no, uh, no, no different. This is uh, the, the individual I'm going to introduce to you in a moment is wonderful. She's doing a lot of cool things. Um, and uh, I will tell you her name in a second. But if you like what you hear, Pass it on to your friends and your family. We're building a, an audience, and the reason we're built, why I want to build an audience, is for one reason: because the people I bring to you are great people and need to be heard. So, without further yammering on my part, it's a pleasure to welcome to the Hamilton Review, Bailey Van Tassel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here, Bailey. So, who is Bailey? Well, Bailey is an author. She has recently written a book called Kitchen Garden Living. It's coming out uh, in December of 2024. You can pre-order it right now on Amazon.com. And where else, Bailey? On Barnes & Noble? Um, yep, Barnes & Noble. Any on time, online book retailer should have it. So again, the name of the book is Kitchen Garden Living. She's also a podcaster. She has a podcast called The Garden Culture Podcast. And most important, she's a mother of three kids. So uh, you kind of fit into my my podcast world very very well here, Bailey. Yes, I'm in. I'm in the thick of it. You are in the thick of it. So I I like to before we dive into all of the things that you were doing, I like to have my guests share a little bit about who they are, their life, where they grew up, what their what their you know what they went through, their journey in this life, um, the path that they have trod and uh, why you're doing what you're doing today. So without further ado, Bailey Van Tassel, the microphone belongs to you. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I grew up in Northern California on a little hobby farm and, uh, you know, from age zero to 18. And it was this cultural mix of sort of these crunchy, hippie meat blue collar ag families. And I fell right in the middle. Uh, my parents divorced when I was young. And I, though I was surrounded by speaking of culture, this sort of strong culture up in Northern California, I felt like I was sort of an apple that fell really far from the tree. I never, my parents did rodeos and they were into hiking and nature, um, a little bit of gardening, not a ton, but they were very outdoorsy people. And I just wanted to be a ballerina and do art classes and play dress up. And I did, I don't even think I put a pair of jeans on until I was probably 14. And my parents have like wranglers and cowboy hats. And, um, I just felt so different from them in that regard. And I wanted to grow up and be a travel journalist and work for Condé Nast and live in the city and wear high heels and don a briefcase. And, as some of those dreams started coming true, and I ended up in Southern California for college uh, in San Diego, I started to see through some of the culture and the facade. And uh, I kind of describe it actually even in the book as like a, a manicure that starts to chip. <laughs> and I really, it was in college that I started feeling this tug to sort of get back to my roots. And so by the time I had met my husband and we were starting to talk about kids. I was like, you know, I will never raise my kids in Southern California. They won't, they won't have any character. Everything's too convenient. I had sort of done this examining of my past and the characters that I grew up with and felt like these salt of the earth people were not born of this Southern California life. So when I embarked on my own parenting journey, I felt really passionate, like we need to leave California, buy a farm, let the kids run loose, you know, kind of like my childhood that I, in the moment, of course, you know, you look back, I think my husband and I both did this and felt like we wanted to recreate the best parts of our childhood. And, um, that gets sticky when you're, you're raised a little bit different. So he has a business here and it just became something that we 
it just became something that we were not going to be able really to do. We were sort of not stuck in Southern California, but it was like, this is where we're going to be. And I had been working in um, marketing and PR. I worked for a boutique hotel brand for a long time. Um, But I always felt like I had this passion potential that was locked within me. And I just couldn't figure out what it was. Um, And my husband and I would do these walks. And I don't know, there was just, there was a lot of angst, like right before I had kids and what is my purpose? What is my path? I don't want to be here. I was very anti Orange County. And um, we finally did have kids and we kept, my husband and I kept having these conversations I'll call them conversations about how I wanted to relocate. I wanted to <laughs> uproot our lives, you know, for this you call it dream. And he kind of was like, um, hey, like, I love that for you, but we I don't know that we should just upend our entire lives like on a on a whim, on an instinct that you think that, you know, and looking back, you weren't even really into nature when you were a kid. You want our kids to have this nature thing. And he's like, you know, we're, we're chatting. I'm like, I just want to have like a giant garden and a creek on the back of our acreage. And he's like, honey, I don't even think if you started to garden, you would maybe really even like that. So why don't we start like investigating some of these claims, you know? And that was the trigger really. And I was like, well, I'll be, you know, I march down to Hope Depot. I get this pot that has six vegetables in it. And I'm like, I, I will garden and I will love it. Um, <laughs> Fast forward, I did. I became incredibly passionate about gardening. I'm in the middle of suburbia. I'm living actually in a town called Costa Mesa, so near Newport Beach. And we were in a townhouse in a cul-de-sac with, we could throw a football to the freeway and there was like an inpatient rehab center sharing a fence with us. Like we're in the thick of it. It's concrete everywhere. And there's this patch of dead grass that I converted. I had managed to convince our HOA to let me use this dead grass grass patch because of the drought for my little garden, built two raised beds, and I drag a hundred foot hose through our townhouse to water the garden. (laughs) And I loved it. I loved it. I had my son, my firstborn was about eight months when we built that garden and it was everything. I was like, I figured it out. I built my little paradise. I bloomed where I was planted. I was where my feet were, you know, all of those cheesy quotes that you hear but it really did change my life. It helped me realize that I could control my reality. I could bring myself back to my roots without having to like be, you know, Ma Ingalls wearing a linen apron and like going out on the prairie. I could create a culture and an environment within our own home that prioritized nature and groundedness and being in touch with the seasons and um, having to co-create with nature to a degree. And then of course, I love to cook. So I was bringing everything inside and we were sharing our veggies with the neighbors and people were having homegrown basil and tomatoes for the first time. And we got to know them. My son and I would walk door to door with these bundles of veggies and deliver them to the neighbors, you know, who were all very charmed by that. And some of them remembered their parents' victory gardens. It was a very cool way to completely shift the reality that I was in and learn to love where I was and really become more authentically myself, which led me down this road of now my whole life revolves around gardening, wrote a book about gardening. My business is around gardening. I've got a gardening podcast, all of it. All of it. You know, um, I, I love this. And, and just going back a little bit to your childhood, I think that a lot of times we look back at our childhood and I certainly had, a, I really had, a, I, I actually grew up in Northern California too. I told you I grew up in not Sonoma County, but I grew up in Humboldt County, which is a little bit north of where you were. Oh, yeah. And um, grew up uh, under the redwood trees and the awesome, uh, and we talked about this on our pre, pre-conversation yesterday, just the the, the amazing um, beauty of just being in that, in that world. Unfortunately, I think, and this is something I'd like to have you comment on, I don't think you appreciate it when you're a kid. You, you kind of look back and you kind of go, whoa, that was really wonderful. And I, and I did you actually, now listen, by the way, I just want you to know the culture you're talking about, the crunchy uh, salt of the earth people, uh, they have those in Humboldt County too. I want you to know oh, that. Yeah. And on, oh, yeah. On steroids. 
They're, they're even they're, <laughs> yeah. they're even crunchier. I think as you move down the state, they get less you know less authentic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. I know that I know us real true Northern Californians. I kind of believe that we are the real we're the real authentic crunchies. But anyway, yeah. so I we I grew up in that kind of culture too. But the reality is that. You know, when you think, when you when you look back at your life, you kind of go, "Whoa, that was pretty amazing." And I do think it's okay. It's okay to actually re remember those moments and try to bring them into the life of your children too. I think that's a natural phenomenon. But speak to that whole thing about your recollections in your childhood, yeah, and and the the things that you remember so poignantly and that cause you to maybe reflect uh, on that. I've thought a lot about this because it, my parents were very shaken up by this change when I became like at, in like once I hit adulthood and all of a sudden, like it was just this irony for them where they were like, I drug them to like the Phantom of the Opera and I wanted designer clothes and like I was just so different and it took a while for the values I think they really hoped they had embedded in me to really come through and take over. So I think for a while they were like, oh man, we just got this. They used to call me the hillbilly in high heels, like when I was in high school. <laughs> um, and I would get teased a lot because a lot of our friends and family were just very, these like, just, just, I, I've always been very down to earth, but I just had this like prissiness about me that was so not fitting for my family and just our, where we were and, um, how it's informed my parenting now, I would say, because no, I did not appreciate the upbringing. I, I left and, and I'm going to keep this G rated, but I remember leaving at 18 and saying, I, I don't want to have horse poop on my shoes and I don't want to have hay in my hair. Like I'm out of here. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Like I was just so over it. And I look back though, and think my parents pursued what was authentic to them. They took me into every scenario with them. They made me really resilient and really tough. I absolutely love, I'm very gritty. Like I look back now on my parents, like my dad and my stepdad, you know, taught me how to roof, how to hunt, how to change a tire. They're helping me change my oil. Like I'm learning these things and it's all getting baked in. And it's informed who I am as an adult and it's created, I feel like this texture when it comes to who I am that you wouldn't know just by looking at me. Uh, and, and I like that. And I think it's the same. It's going to be the same for my kids. I don't really, it's not my job to, to, um, I don't know how to put it. Like obviously to judge who they are, it's just my job to be my best self and, help introduce them to the beauties of the world and hope that someday it clicks for them as well. Um, and, you know, really we've, I've really fought for us to live by our values and that's something that my parents really did. And I got to see a lot of examples of that and the people around us as well. So that was something for my kids. I'm like, if we're going to live in a place where I feel like it's misaligned with our really deep core values, we really have to live by them and we really have to be exemplary of of that. So it became a huge priority for me to get the kids super exposed to nature, to like farm living, um, getting dirty, find like for introducing them to foraging and talking about plants and the seasons and just being in nature and not being a part of the grind. Because I just don't think that builds, like I said, so it doesn't really convenience does not build character in my opinion. So I was like, I'm going to have to find a way to like give them chores in a place where that isn't really the norm. So are you still living in that townhouse? No, we sold the townhouse and bought a home in San Juan Capistrano, still Southern Cal Southern, Southern California, South Orange County. Um, is bigger home, a little bit more space, but we still were on less, less than a quarter of an acre. And my garden, I went from two raised beds to 10. Wow. Uh, and so I convinced, you know, my poor family, they, they never got to have a swimming pool because mom has her garden. But um, <laughs> it's still, it's, it's pretty, it's only about 350 square feet. We've just really maximized it. Yeah, so you can do a lot with 360, 360 square feet. That's a lot of square footage in, in for a garden. And if you know what you're doing, you can actually, you know, plant crops all year long, as you well know. 
and you can get a lot you can get a lot of produce. So so tell us, and, I, and I'm a little bit fascinated. So you grow a, a pretty big garden, and you're are you there every are you out there in that garden every day? I am, yeah. Um, less so. It depends on how you do it, but I, I used to only hand water, and I feel like that was the best for my mental health because it forced me to be out there. I'm like, if I'm not out there watering, the plants are going to die. Um, and I also really liked designing our life around something more important than ourselves. And I thought that was important for the kids too, where it's like, we are responsible for this. And we talk a lot about that with animals and bugs and all of that. Um, but once I put automatic irrigation in a lot less time in the garden, because I don't have to do as much heavy lifting. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm out there every single day. I've really, it's become a part of our rhythms. And I really feel like I've trained my brain to crave nature and outdoors when I'm feeling dysregulated or overwhelmed or stressed. And uh, I feel like I've modeled that well for the kids too, where it's like, let's just go outside. Uh, I have a good friend as well. She runs um, the 1000 hours outside. Have you heard of Totally. This. Yes. I've had her on my and show. Are you talking about Jenny Urich? Jenny. God, she's the best. Yeah. No, I, and I love Jenny Urich. I mean, I, absolutely. I know exactly. And I completely yeah. embrace this idea that I think that, and I'll just throw it out there. I do think that I tell my patients all day long, uh, Bailey, that <clears throat> children should live outside. Children thrive when they're at parks. They thrive when they're in forests that you mentioned when you were a kid. You grew up kind of running around the, the woods. You actually get, would get lost in the woods. I love that that concept um, to a degree. <laughs> Not well, me. and I have to tell you, I yeah. don't want to interrupt, but when I, I went to a preschool before there was such a thing, before it was a trend to have like forest school, I went to this preschool, Margaret's, in a place called Occidental, which is like, we're talking in the Redwoods. And we would play in these hollowed out blackberry tunnels where we had made this like tunnel system under these blackberry bushes. And I mean, in the state of California now, like you would be like you would be imprisoned for like setting up a preschool like this. But we loved it. And we were just and this is where we were like using these old redwood stumps to play kitchen. And um, it was the way it, I, I feel like, I mean, and it's going to give away my age, but I was born in the late eighties. I feel like that's the tail end of the last childhood where kids are really, you know, there are goods and bads with the way the parenting style was back then, but that outdoorness and that, like my parents, I remember my parents being like, you better not come in clean. Like we want you dirty when you walk in the door. So go figure it out. Like, just go figure it out. And yeah. I joke with people that I was like in our pasture playing with rusty horse nails, but, but I was, and it was awesome. And I, you have to like contrive that if you live in the suburbs now, it's not, it's not natural. It's not what other people are doing. And, um, but I think it's wildly important. I mean, now I feel like my kids, it's like you hit hour three of playing outside at a park and they're like in a groove now. And yeah. I think that's really intimidating for people who aren't used to it, but it's, it makes for way happier days, for sure. Absolutely. And they're not spending their time looking at screens and, and getting anxious about the whole thing. You, you, said, you said something to me uh, on our pre-call, which, which really um, resonated. And you're saying that the just being outside, and you mentioned this, that when sometimes you need to get regulated, that being outside, being in your garden, working, working with these things that you're working with. By the way, a quick aside. Do you have animals as well? Do you have chickens and rabbits and that kind of thing? Or is it just only gardening? Not yet. It's only gardening. I, I grew up with horses, mules, chickens. We had a sheep live in the house for a short period of time. Um, L- and hold on. Live, live in the house? In the house. In the house. And did the in sheep the house. Ha- did they have their own bedroom? And did they have, you know. Did... <laughs> Tippy was a bummer lamb, which means um, she never took to her mom. And so you have to bottle feed these lambs. And we had a neighbor with sheep and, you know, does Bailey want to have a lamb? And of course my mom says, yes. And then this sheep now thinks it's a dog and it's running around the house. It's pooping everywhere. I'm not going to subject your audience to Tippy's ill fate, but there was a a lovely season of life where we had a lamb live in the house. Okay. And that's why I'm never sick. <laughs> okay. And, and um, maybe that's that's why she found her way on my podcast, by the way, guys. You have to have a lamb living in your house before I'll invite you to my podcast. Um, so, you, but you say, and this is so true, and I know it to be true, but I want you to say it. Your serotonin levels 
are increased when you're yeah. and, and being outdoors, doing what you're doing decreases, you know, anxiety and other things. But tell us a little bit about you, you've done yeah. research on this. And I like I'm curious about what you have to say. Yeah, I started doing research because um, I saw a study come out of the UK about how gardening is. It was being prescribed by doctors in 20 minute increments for people that have anxiety and depression. Like they would literally go in and the doctor would be like, you need to start gardening, start a garden, go to a community garden, figure something out 20 minutes every single day. And I was looking into what the research was behind that because I wanted to know why, because I wanted to talk about it. And um, there are a couple of things. Number one, when you are playing in the dirt, planting, gardening, you're kicking up microbes that do release serotonin in your brain. Like that's science, it's biology. So I feel like we were really meant to be interfacing with nature. It helps us be happy. It's similar to now there's a ton of information about when you get outside and you have your eyes on that morning sun, like it helps regulate your dopamine. It helps with your circadian rhythm. Like biologically, the way we react to nature is helping us. So that serotonin, of course, that's the happy hormone. Um, but then alongside that, you also have, um, there, there's like this moving meditation component and then mixed with the green space, like the act of exposing yourself to the, the views of nature. So this can apply sometimes they'll say like children sitting in school in class or in a hospital, if you're looking out a window that has nature, your perceived amount of joy and happiness is higher. And that's the same when you're actually gardening is it increases your perceived happiness and joy, which as we all know is our reality. So, um, a lot of it is there's obviously the science where the serotonin is being increased, but we're also, it's increasing the amount of satisfaction that we have and the amount of like happiness we're able to access. And, and I guess this is an opinion. There is neuroscience behind some of this, but I don't want to claim that I know it, but I do believe the more that we expose ourselves to certain feelings, the more that we can expand into them and the more that we're going to seek out those positive feelings as opposed to get stuck in the negatives. So um, I started seeing a lot of this and then I've, I've embarked on, you know, I, I love, I love a good rabbit hole, like the next gal, um, but understanding too, really the benefits for people that are even more neurodivergent. We're talking about ADHD and all of those things, how nature can be so absolutely calming for the nervous system and for people that have sensory processing disorder and anything like that, it, it tends to be this beautiful neutralizer. So you wonder if, in fact, the, the bump in ADHD uh, diagnoses is, is a function of the fact that we're living indoors more and we're not getting out, we're not letting our kids uh, loosen and, and allowing them to discover the world. You kind of wonder, do you, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things, listen, I, I happen to be, and I'm, I've told you this, I, I happen to be a kind of an amateur gardener too. I like to go outside. <laughs> my my role is, is more of weeding. I know that sounds like a very boring thing for a lot of people, but I actually kind of get off on weeding. I like to weed. Are, are you a weeder? Do you like to weed? I love weeding. Every time I'm out in the garden, I'm just, I feel like I'm, you know, there's, the garden is just so rich with analogies, but I always feel like it's reminding me of how as humans, we need to remove things that are not useful to make room for things that are. Weeds are essentially nothing more than just unwanted plants. Everything's a weed and nothing is a weed. So um, it's really about what do we want to have space for? What's useful to us? Um, and every time I'm out there, I'm like, God, it feels good. And then you're in the process of weeding and there's more than you thought and you're getting it all out and you're realizing you're just creating airflow and abundance. And now you've got room to plant things that you want to have there. And that's, I love it. <laughs> but I also do make my children pull weeds when they're, when they're naughty. <laughs> <laughs> So you're going to create a little, <laughs> a different dynamic in them when they get a little bit older. But, you know, I do yeah. think that it, there is a certain metaphor about weeding. I think when you when you're pulling out things that are, I mean, obviously weeds aren't there; they aren't all bad. You know, you think about bad weed, um, but you can they are they're kind of bad in the sense that you don't want them in your garden, right? And so you you pull these dandelions out, and listen, I, I happen to marvel at dandelions. You look at these darn things and they, they float in the air and they're wonderful, but they really get deep roots in your garden. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I do, but I will say dandelion roots are 
they're medicinal. They're very good for you. And you can roast them and use them to drink like a coffee replacement. So it's not all bad. So let me tell you, Bailey, I will never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, no way am I going to, you know, boil down dandelion roots. And maybe there are people out there listening who would never, you know, never, who would stop losing listen, my podcast. Listen, I have your daughter's information. We're going to see about this. <laughs> That's right. By the way, I, I want everyone to know that I found Bailey Van Tassel through my daughter, Emily, who has, has become a real follower of you and your and everything you're doing. She listens to you on a pretty common, you know, frequent basis. And she's got a phenomenal garden. You saw a picture of it yesterday and what she's doing. And I have to tell you, she derives, and I, and I derive too. I go over there in, into Emily's little spot there and I just, I, I'm happy to spend an hour or two in her garden, her garden, just kind of, you know, weeding things and taking things and moving dirt and all that kind of stuff that you do when you're a gardener. Do you ever just sit back, uh, Bailey, uh, in your garden and just revel in the in the amazing what you've created? Does does how does that feel when you sit down and have a glass of wine or whatever at the end of the day and just do you ever do that? Just kind of sit down in a in the chase lounge and look at your garden. Yeah. Oh gosh. Of course. I, it's funny. Um, so we are moving, we're leaving this house and this garden that we've built right now. Um, I, I believe it's really beautiful. It's sort of like a French potager style. It's got the wooden raised beds and a big arch trellis. And I like to plant things so that when they mature, they look there's an aesthetic that's achieved. There's like this layering that, so you can see the different plants and textures and colors um, so that things are working with a lot of biodiversity and uh, we've got companion planting, like all of that. And these are things I talk about in in the book actually coming up is how to plant things densely with a lot of biodiversity. So you don't have to interfere, you know, it's all completely organic and done really naturally for, for maximum impact and maximum health for the garden, you know, really we're really looking at growing in a way that's as close to nature as possible. There should not be a ton of intervention from the gardener. Like we are just cultivating, but we're not interfering a lot. Um, yesterday I was walking through the garden and I do feel proud about it because again, my husband does not come from the same background that I do. And I think he felt kind of like, how are we going to make this look nice? You know, are we going to, this is going to be like tangled up craziness or is it going to be a as, you know, something that increases the value of our home and brings everyone a lot of joy. And undoubtedly, you know, everyone, it's like a magnet. Everyone comes to the house. They want to go straight into the garden. Um, it's beautiful. It's, it's tidy, but there is a, a whimsy about it. And I keep borders around the edge of the garden. And yesterday the kids and I were out there and um, my son was catching, was like gathering bugs and my daughter was picking flowers. And it was one of those moments where I thought like, I did it. Like I built, I built the place I wanted and the kids are out here with me and it's calm and it's lovely and it's free. I mean, my kids now they'll eat like the green tops off of onions and they're, they're munching on kale and everything that's out there is completely safe and edible for that reason. It's theirs as much as it's mine. But I noticed that in the borders, I was sitting there and it kind of brought tears to my eyes. I had planted things not anticipating that we were going to move and um, perennials that come back and that you, you cut back and then they come back in full effect every single year, like my artichoke. And I had sown, so my artichokes coming in big bloom, you know, this is like, it's been four years and finally she's giving me artichoke and she's so beautiful. And next to that, I realized that some seeds I had sown two years ago, finally came to be of, um, for hollyhocks. They're these like really, really tall green plants that have these big bright flowers and they grow really well where we are. The mission in San Juan has them everywhere. They wanted a bunch of hollyhocks. I really like the feeling of the border and the walls of the garden kind of coming in on you a little bit. So you feel very in the garden, you know, and I finally started to see these plants come up and it just gave me this amazing sense of gratitude that I was able to create something so that will really outlast. Like it helps you really realize. So perennials, there's perennials and then there are annuals. The annuals will die every year. You have to replace them. Perennials, <clears throat> take care of them, will come back season after season after season. And I felt 
just really proud to know what I know and have done the research and get and really put the time in to build something meant to last that would bless people beyond me and thinking about the people that would enjoy the artichoke after me and the hollyhocks that would come back every year because of the foresight and the work out there. So it was, we, I mean, that's definitely my happy place. I'm always positioning myself to be looking at the garden because it just sort of takes you away. And um, I don't know, it just, in, it invites you in. I think a well-designed garden invites you in. It takes you on a journey. It moves you through the space. And it really, in adults, there are not a ton of moments where we feel so much, I think, like awe Um, and gardening. I feel like no matter who you are, it does that where you're like seeing the seeds sprout and you're, it's remarkable. It really is. Um, And so it's fun to be reminded of that. So do you plant uh, flowers in your garden? Because you you mentioned several several vegetables. Do you plant? Do you plant flowers as well? Is it is it both? You're doing both things. You, you Absolutely, talk, you're talking yeah. about a bohemian, you have to a bohemian style kind of garden, and uh, so you have you have color as well. Yeah, I believe I. I mean, I believe it's super important to have flowers in the garden to increase pollination. You know, we have some the world, especially the United States, our country has not done a great job of taking care of the land and all of our soft-bodied insects and pollinators and the bees and all that. So we need help. You need, you need flowers in the garden because the vegetables are not going to turn into flowers until the end of their life cycle, which is, you know, they bolt, they go to flower, they go to seed once the veggies have died off or you've picked them. Um, So yeah, you need the flowers for sure. And also I just think they, they bring joy. They do. And I, and I think they, they make the garden more interesting to people. They're, listen, there are people who are different levels of va- you know, who, va- who value gardens differently. But I think that most people are drawn to color. And that's a good thing. By the way, do you buy worms? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have. I don't need to anymore, but I have. Okay. Because my, my daughter is buying worms. And, I, and I, when she told me she was buying worms, I thought that was the, the oddest right. thing in the world. But she has, she bought this, I guess you can go online and buy worms. I, this is Amazon something. will sell you worms. I, I did not know this. <laughs> is one Isn't of the, it amazing? I know. Well, I, yes, I, worms, you need to increase. Well, you'll know you have healthy soil if you like dig your hands into the soil and you pull it up and there are worms in with the dirt. If you do that and there are no worms, any point in the garden and you scoop it up and there are no worms, it's, there's a little bit of trouble. So you got to put worms in and then, and then it'll all start to balance itself out. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, <laughs> I'm learning things from my my daughter Emily. Next I'm, thing you know, you're going to be vermicomposting, and you're going to be like <laughs> really, really passionate about worm poop. That's the next level. Is that the next level? Worm? worm yeah, sorry, you'll be worm, drinking worm, your dandelion tea and talking about worm poop. Oh my gosh! Oh my, we future. love this for you. This is, you're this, so green. This is good. So, I, I another question. This is kind of a random question, but when you're talking about layering and this whole thing about just having this bohemian garden. I I just recently got back from Giverny. Do you know where Giverny is? Mm, yes. So have you been there? No, I have not. Okay. So Giverny, of course, was the garden of Monet. And Monet made this garden. He was outside of Paris. It's about an hour out of Paris. And we just were, we were there. We just, we were in Paris for a, a short time. And we, we took one day and went out to Giverny. I have to tell you, uh, Bailey, it, when I got there, I literally, and even as I think about it now, it just brought tears in my eyes. It was so beautiful. Mm. Uh, it was just, it was early spring. It was just a flame with mm-hmm. tulips and all of these beautiful, beautiful colors. And I just went, oh my gosh, no wonder this guy was a successful artist. He would go out there and of course he painted, you know, he painted from his garden. You know that. Mm-hmm. Yes. And he also, he also did the, he also made that lily pond that you've seen all of his lily pads. Mm-hmm. That was his creation. He built, he mm-hmm. built this little, little pond in his backyard. It was amazing. Well, ponds are super important <clears throat> for our ecosystems. And something I've loved learning about with ponds and that I, I see these themes throughout just every part of daily life is that all of the action happens on the edges. So in our, in nature, at the edge of the riverbed, at the edge of the pond, that's like where all the action is happening, where these two worlds are converging and you're seeing um, like the feelings and the drama and the, you're seeing the nature at the edges. But something I have to tell you about Monet, which is incredible, is he had a huge 
huge kitchen garden. So huge vegetable garden that someone professionally maintained for him. He wanted as many fresh veggies as possible. And similar to what I just talked about, Monet actually had peonies in the border surrounding his vegetable garden all the way around so that he could have fresh peonies in the house when they were in season. I don't know if you got to see that part of it, but um, I absolutely loved learning that about his garden. I think there's a lot that you could tell about a person based on the la- their landscaping. Yes, indeed. And and listen, the peonies were, were just in bright color over there at this time. So we got to see plenty of peonies. So he had oh. peonies in his little flower garden too. We did not see his vegetable garden. I'm not sure it still exists, mm. but uh, he had a, I will tell you one thing, he had a gigantic kitchen that was just huge. And one of the things he loved to do was he loved to bring his family together. And he had a lot of kids. He married a woman who had several children. So he ended up having two, a couple of his own with his first wife. His second wife had a ton of kids and they would have these family meals and he had a kitchen to, to co- accommodate all of this action. I love that. It, it, it pretty is pretty cool. So listen, um, the, I, I, I love, you know, my, my, Subtitle of my podcast is Where Kids and Culture Collide. I do want to finish up here. I'm watching our time. I want to finish up here with your thoughts about kids in the garden, because I know uh, that you are all about that. Why is it important for kids to be in gardens? You may have, you may have, you've touched on this already, but I'm just, I just want you to answer that question directly. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, really important that we remember that children especially in their early years, and you would know up to what age, but that they have unstructured play. That's how they learn. And I feel like the garden is a really safe place for them to explore and convene in nature where you also get to be sort of like, I think I used this word before, but like co-creating with them. And you get to have this really beautiful dialogue. And I feel like there's It's important for them to experience like that, all of those benefits we talked about, the serotonin and digging in the dirt. But I think it's also just super important for them to explore and then for you to also be able to teach without teaching. And I've seen so much benefit where I get to learn a lot about my kids based on the way that they want to interface out there. Um, And I feel like it's just it's just somewhere that they get to be free. And I feel like that's really important, but also useful. Children really want to be useful and they want to be a part of the team and they want to be a part of the family. And this is a really safe place for them to learn so many things, especially that are just not going to be taught in a traditional school setting. Um, And I even find now as my kids get older, I've got a seven-year-old that I'm able to describe a lot of things about life because we've got this foundation of the garden where things are living and they're dying and they're blooming and they're sensitive and they're, they require participation from bugs. And there's just so much, it's so rich with information to entice and excite them in a way that's entirely different from any sort of indoor play um, and anything else that's structured or team-based or requires a lot of rules. Um, I just, and I've tried really hard to make gardening with kids also like with the exception as they've gotten a little older, sometimes we need them really to help from a chore perspective, but I never, you know, make them be on the garden. But when you go out there, they just follow you out. And I feel like it's really important for kids to be more free. And this is a place where they can be free and they can experiment and be very tactile. And um, I think it, it informs a lot about who they are in the long term. Yeah. And they also they also benefit from just that whole thing of discovery. I'm sure they find bugs. I'm sure they find slugs. They find other little creatures that are crawling around, and they look at them, and they probably observe them, study them. Uh, do your kids ever get stung by bees? Yes, actually. So my oldest son used to catch bees and was always gentle with them, but he's been stung by many bees. And actually, my youngest also, he's one, just got stung by a bee. Um, and we just don't panic about it. Bees are our friends and they're really important. And if you're calm and you like are patient with them and just leave them alone, they're fine. You know, but it's, it's interesting because they'll go to school. My, my kids do go to, um, school so far as of now, we'll see. And, um, everyone's panicking about bees all the time. And so it's just, it's no biggie, but I mean, you got to keep an eye on it. You know, to make sure it's allergic, but 
I think I went a little too far. My my kids really have no fear of bugs. They're pulling tomato hornworms off and they're pulling grubs out. And it's to the point where I'm like, okay, just pretend like you're not afraid. I'm like, okay, you can go ahead and throw that over the fence. Like, <laughs> so they just do all, you know, I was like at first, you know, show no fear. I want them to be into it. And now they're like really into it. Yeah. No, I mean, my, my uh, daughter's son, Luca is a, is a big, a bug finder. And he, he does, he's, you know, he's learning the same thing, not to be afraid. That's for sure. Some people go, Ooh, a bug, you know, but not, mm-hmm. not, not well, my. Just, and it's, it's every lesson. I just, I love finding ways to, to like send them out to find new things in the garden. We made a bug snug, which is like um, something to help bugs over winter. You can like pile up a bunch of dead sticks and that's a bug. So I sent the kids out to find a bug snug. And then it's like, sometimes I'll be like, I, you know, I want you to find 10 grubs. Like you can just, just send them off on these errands and these tasks and they're learning and it's experiential and it just takes them in and time sort of stands still. It's just, it's so good. Beautiful moments. They really are. The other thing too, I always like to remind people is when you're a kid, you're, you're, you're short, you're, you know, you're knee, knee high mm. and, in a garden, that garden that you are not, you are saying is not that big. It's pretty big in my mind, but that garden is infinity to them because they're looking at it from a different perspective, from this perspective. It's like when you take a kid to the park and they, you know, they're two feet high, three feet high, whatever they are. They look at a, uh, a a grass opening, like at a park, and it looks like the Serengeti to them. I mean, yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like it goes forever. And you're I think, right. You're right. Mm-hmm. And, I, and we I, have raised beds. So ours are 18 inches high. So like it's all at eye level. Yeah. So they're looking at your garden from a from very totally different perspective. And to them, it is infinite. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I like to, that's one reason why I tell all my patients, take your kids to the park, live at the park, live outside as much as you possibly can. Um, I want to, as we finish up here, I, I want you to, uh, remind people the name of your book, how to find you, your podcast. So, uh, tell us again, if you yeah. would, Bailey. Yes. So everything is housed at baileyvantassel.com, but the book is called Kitchen Garden Living, and it's all about how to build, grow, maintain a vegetable garden, but also how to fold it into your everyday life. Every single section has a component for for the little ones in our lives. So how to get the kids out there and involved in anything you're doing um, in the garden, how to make your home, you know, more seasonal and focused around nature and the seasons that we experience. And then the podcast is the Garden Culture Podcast, and it's on all the podcast platforms. And I have weekly shows uh, where we interview people. I talk, um, I do some solo shows where I just talk about gardening or life. And yeah, it's really all about how we fold gardening into the everyday and make it a part of our modern our modern experience now. You know, when I started gardening, I thought it was very like, when I'm old and retired, I'll, I'll garden. I think that's a huge huge missed opportunity. Yes, you can do it all your life. Uh, Bailey Van Van Tassel is spelled B-A-I-L-E-Y V-A-N-T-A-S-S-E-L and that's baileyvantassel.com. Is that where who you are? Yes. 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 So that's where you find her. Uh, She said her name very fast. So I wanted to slow it down a little bit. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, But anyway, listen, um, You are a a wonderful, wonderful, amazing uh, guest, uh, and thank you for taking the time to be on my show today. I really appreciate it. Appreciate what you're doing. I wish you the very best as you head out to Tennessee. You'll probably be able to get a big, big farm out there uh, and start raising goats and chickens. And you might even, what was the name of that sheep? Tipper? Tippy? Tippy. Tippy. You can even find a tippy of your own and bring it in the house. And so your children, your three children will have great stories to tell when they're adults. You have to think about that, Bailey. You're right. You're right. We've got to, we've got to arm them with good stories. My husband is going to be, he's excited. We might do mini donkeys. I've got, I've got, I've got a maybe on that. And as all wives know, a maybe is not a no. It's basically a yes. So a, a mini, I'm sorry, a mini donkey. What, what, I don't yes. know about this either. Okay. Mini donkeys. You know, it's like a mini horse. They're like the size of a, of like a large dog. They're just miniature donkey and wow. they're great companion animals. And they're just, it's sort of a novelty pet, but you know, yeah. why would you not? So uh, in addition to dandelion coffee, um, <laughs> worm poop, <laughs> 
Are you telling me that I should get a, a miniature donkey as well? 100%. <laughs> okay. Okay. 100%. You're, You're going to need to move to Topanga. I don't know where you live now. Yeah, but. Well, I'm, we're clo- <laughs> I'm close enough to Topanga to feel the, the vibe to, from those guys. But anyway, listen, I you're you're blowing my mind here, dear. Uh, but I, I, I love what you're doing, and I wish you the very, very utmost best as you move back to Tennessee. But friends, I have ordered her book, Kitchen Garden Living, already. It's a pre-order. Do it. So whenever the time comes, she'll have a billion... Uh, billion books sold so she can then come back to California and buy a mansion and <laughs> with a big garden, of course. Yes. Um, but anyway, uh, Bailey, it's been really a pleasure having you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. This is lovely. It's been fun. And friends, uh, all you listening, thank you very much for tuning into the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Go out and start a garden. It's still early in the year, and you can do it, and you will benefit from it by some worms as well. Until then, until next time, take care. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the Hamilton Review, where kids and culture collide. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day. Tune in again next week on Apple Podcasts. Rate and comment and tell a friend.